please turn in your Bibles now to Job chapter 33. Job 33. Job 33 is the second half of the first speech of Elihu. Elihu is a late arrival to the book of Job. Uh, Job is the first person we meet, a righteous man, uh, serving God, fearing God, who is uh, suddenly and terribly afflicted by suffering. Three friends come and speak with him. That's what we read from chapters 3 through 31, the dialogue that they had together about why Job is suffering, how he should respond. Now Elihu, not satisfied with what any of them have said, has come to speak, and he is going to provide, he hopes, the much-needed wisdom uh, that Job and his friends are looking for. He has already spoken to the friends in chapter 32. He's told the friends they have been wrong. Their approach has been condemning Job, but they cannot prove Job has guilt. And so he has rebuked that. Now he will turn and speak directly to Job. So we'll listen to him as he speaks first in the first seven verses as Elihu tries to prepare Job for wisdom that is both firm and gentle. Wisdom that is firm and gentle. Listen to God's word. Job 33, 1 through 7. However, now, Job, please hear my speech and listen to all my words. Behold, now I open my mouth. My tongue in my mouth speaks. My words are from the uprightness of my heart, and my lips speak knowledge sincerely. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Refute me if you can. Array yourselves before me. Take your stand. Behold, I belong to God like you. I too have been formed out of the clay. Behold, no fear of me should terrify you, nor should my pressure weigh heavily on you. These are still introductory ideas as he continues his speech. First, verses 1 and 2, he simply is asking Job to listen to what he has to say. Verses 3 and 4, he wants to affirm again that he is honest, he is speaking the truth, he is sincere in what he is saying. Uh, I mentioned as we looked at chapter 32, I don't think he is claiming to be prophetic, that he's speaking the very words of God. Uh, I think he's claiming to be created by God and have wisdom from God, which he is able to share with Job. Uh, So then, verse 5, he says to Job, get ready for a fight. Uh, These are going to be strong words. They are not light words, easily dismissed. They can stand a test if you want to refute me. You're going to need to bring all your skill. And so he has this imagery of being arrayed for battle. And then, almost with an awkward transition, he says, but don't worry, I'm just a man. So don't don't be afraid of me, because I'm a man like you. And so it's it's a bit of a strange balance that he's trying to have, but I think it's, it's basically something good. He's wanting to say on the one hand, My words are firm. My words are strong. My words are things that are valuable and need to be taken seriously. On the other hand, he wants to share the truth in love, in a non-intimidating way. He wants to be a helper to Job. Now, as we read these words of Elihu and and all of Elihu's words, we, we ask ourselves over and over, was that successful? Did it work? Did it not work? Often we have to answer, well, we never hear in this book how Job responded, how the friends responded, so we don't know exactly how these things landed, but we can at least recognize this is a good goal that he has, that he's trying to be firm and gentle. So after these introductory words next, we will listen as Elihu summarizes Job's position, and that is that Job claims to be an innocent man suffering unjust attacks from God. An innocent man suffering unjust attacks from God. Listen to verses 8 through 11. He says, Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words. I am pure, without transgression. I am innocent, and there is no guilt in me. Behold, he invents pretexts against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. So verses 9 through 11, Elihu is quoting Job's, well, not not a direct quote, but summarizing what Job has said. There are two basic ideas that Elihu picks out as significant from all that Job has said. He is first claimed to be innocent, pure, without iniquity. Now, as we've listened to Job, we can agree this is 
one of the main things that Job has talked about, his blamelessness. Now, Job, we've recognized that he was a bit more careful than this. Job did not claim to be absolutely sinless. Job claimed that his suffering was disproportionate to his sin, that, that, that the amount of suffering he was experiencing could not be matched up to the sins he had committed, and so it was not a just punishment. He was not somebody who should have been punished by God in that way, by that suffering. So Elihu doesn't seem to have that nuance. I say let's give him a, a B plus on, on summarizing Job here. It's not, it's not quite right, but this is a big thing that Job has talked about, and especially at the end, as Job gave his full speech, chapter 31, here's all my righteousness, Elihu can be forgiven for thinking Job thought he was basically perfect. He, Job definitely has pushed that point as he came to the end of his speech. So that's one element, Job claiming to be an innocent man. The next part of his summary is Job saying God has attacked him unjustly. And this part uh, will give Elihu an A. It's a very good summary that he gives, that Job has said God is against him, counting him as an enemy. Verse 11 is actually a quote, a direct quote, from what Job said, chapter 13, verse 27. So Elihu has been listening well. He, remember, he didn't have this all written down to review it. He was there listening to what they were saying. He repeats back to Job, Job, this is what you have been saying about God. So from summary, Elihu moves to evaluation. So verses 12 to 14 Elihu rejects Job's position on the grounds that this is not what God has revealed to man. Elihu rejects Job's position on the grounds this is not what God has revealed to man. Listen to verses 12 to 14. Behold, let me tell you, you are not right in this, for God is greater than man. Why do you complain against him that he does not give an account of all his doings? Indeed, God speaks once or twice, yet no one notices it. Why is Job wrong? Well, verse 12 is a very brief summary statement. Job is wrong because God is greater than man. And I've spent some time thinking about that statement because it, it frustrates me in some ways. This has not been a matter of debate. All the way through, Job, Job's friends, nobody has questioned this idea. This is something that, that has not been on the table to ask questions about. Everybody has agreed God is greater than man. Uh, so I think Elihu needs to meet a certain challenge here as he makes this claim. He needs to show why this statement is significant. and He needs to show he's not just making an appeal to force. One, what this statement could mean, just, Job, God is bigger than you are, so don't ask questions. That could be the way that you make a statement like this. And, and if that's what Elihu is doing, then it's not very helpful. But I do think Elihu is more careful that he develops this idea. He clarifies what he means about God, and he does that in verses 13 and 14 as he begins to speak about God's revelation. Now, verse 13, he asks the question, as it's translated in the New American Standard that I'm reading, why do you complain against him? that he does not give an account of all his doings. If that is uh, what Elihu is saying, God does not give an account of all his doings, then he's going to say, well, in fact, God does speak, but we need to say, Elihu, that's a big overstatement. God does not explain every single thing that he does uh, and give to mankind an account of all his actions. Um, Elihu does do some overstatement. I don't think he does here, though. I think a better translation, which is in the ESV or others, is, is like this. Why do you contend against him, saying he will answer none of man's words? Job is frustrated by the silence of God. Job is frustrated that he is calling out and God is not answering. And Elihu is saying, why are you saying God does not answer? God does answer. That's the point Elihu wants to make, that God is a God who speaks. Job should not assume that God is silent about the questions Job has been asking. And so Elihu is going to build this idea of God speaking once and twice. The idea is you need to keep on counting, that God speaks in many ways, that God doesn't stop speaking, that even if God has a stubborn person 
who is not willing to pay attention, verse 14, no one notices, God will continue to speak to his people. And so for Elihu, the greatness of God, God is greater than man, is something we discover as we listen to what God has said to us, the ways that he has spoken to us. And Elihu then develops this idea in three examples of how God speaks, how God reveals himself. First, he says God reveals through dreams. God reveals through dreams. Verses 15 to 18. He says, In a dream, a vision of the night, when sound sleep falls on men while they slumber in their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction that he may turn man aside from his conduct and keep man from pride. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from passing over into Sheol. This is a way that God revealed himself, especially in those patriarchal times. We can think of stories of Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, all these men understood um, God's, God spoke to them through dreams. And so this is a way God reveals himself. Uh, It's not a foolproof way to know God's voice. If you think back to chapter 4 in in Job, Eliphaz had a dream, and we looked at that dream and said, this is a a dark and not quite helpful dream that you're telling us about. So so a, a vision is not something foolproof. Elihu says, though, as God reveals himself, here's the basic thing you get from God's revelation. God is going to stir your conscience. When God gives you these these revelations, you are going to have your ears opened, your instruction, for the purpose, verse 17, of turning aside from what is wrong. Your conduct, the things that you are doing, your pride, what's in your heart. God is turning you back from sin. God is revealing himself so that he can preserve you, so that he can save you from the punishment of death. Now, is this what God is doing with Job? Is this a good example? Well, Job has had a few dreams. He's told us more, more like terrors, night terrors, that, that, that he's experienced as part of his suffering. Perhaps Elihu is referencing that. Perhaps Elihu just is using this one as the, the general idea to get things started. The next one, he will be much more pointed toward Job. And the next one is this. God reveals through suffering. God reveals through suffering. Verses 19 to 22. Man is also chastened with pain on his bed and with unceasing complaint in his bones so that his life loathes bread and his soul favorite food. His flesh wastes away from sight and his bones which were not seen stick out. Then his soul draws near to the pit and his life to those who bring death. Suffering, it's... It's a terrible suffering that he describes, and it's, it's too close to what Job has said not to be a reference to Job, I think. The, Job has specifically talked, for example, about the way his skin is being destroyed in his suffering. And Elihu says, for example, when people suffer, they may have their skin destroyed. And so we can, we can tell Elihu is thinking this, this could be an application to Job. But the first, the word at the beginning is what frames what he wants him to see. What does this suffering reveal? This suffering reveals chastening. Chastening or a rebuke. It is to point out that something is wrong in us. It is to guide us toward repentance. Now this is not a new idea that Elihu brings up. We can go back to chapter 5, the very first speech of the first friend, Eliphaz. And hear him say something very similar. Chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he inflicts pain and gives relief. He wounds and his hands also heal. So Elihu says suffering, similar to what Eliphaz said, can be a way of God turning us back from our sin. Now Elihu has promised us new arguments. He said, I'm not going to argue like the friends did. So we need to wonder if he's going to keep that promise, but let's keep listening to him and let him finish what he has to say and, and, and then consider what he's told us. So God reveals through dreams, through suffering. Then he says, God may even reveal through a mediator. God may even reveal through a mediator. Verses 23 through 28. If there is an angel 
as a mediator for him, one out of a thousand, to remind a man what is right for him. Then let him be gracious to him and say, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresher than in youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then he will pray to God and he will accept him that he may see his face with joy and he may restore his righteousness to man. He will sing to men and say, I have sinned and perverted what is right and it is not proper for me. He has redeemed my soul from going to the pit and my life shall see the light. This is another way Elihu says that God reveals himself to man, that it is something Job has wondered about. Could there be a mediator? Could there be someone to go between God and man to help bridge that gap? Job has wanted someone to bring his case before God. Elihu envisions a mediator with a a bit of a different function. He says this is not very likely, one out of a thousand. Not very many people get this sort of revelation. He says, but it's not impossible. God could use this angel. If he did use the angel, Elihu knows what he would say. What would he say? Well, he would say, first, there's hope. He'd say there's hope for grace. There's hope for God to redeem you. There's hope for God to restore you. There's a ransom so that you can be brought back. And then the man, the suffering man who heard this message, he would be restored and he would, he would not have any pride. He would not have arrogance about this, but he would look at himself and he would say, I am a sinner saved by God's grace. He would be open in saying that to others. He, it says he would sing it to others. He would tell them, God has redeemed my soul from the pit My life shall see the light. He would have no boast in himself. All he would say before men is that God is a glorious Savior. And that's how a mediator could help this man. So Elihu gives all these examples of revelation. And then finally, Elihu summarizes his point. What is his point? God consistently reveals himself as a Savior. God consistently reveals himself as a Savior. Verses 29 to 33. Behold, God does all these oftentimes with men to bring back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Pay attention, O Job. Listen to me. Keep silent and let me speak. Then if you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you If not, listen to me, keep silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Remember how Elihu opened his argument, his evaluation of Job. He said, Job, you are not right because God is greater than man. Well, what does that mean? Here he's he's given us his explanation. He has said, God is greater than man. We know this because of the way that God reveals himself. Specifically, God shows himself to be a savior. And if if we go back and look through the revelations, we can see he keeps coming back to this idea. Uh, Back in verse 18, what is God accomplishing? He's keeping back this soul from the pits. He's protecting a person from the grave. Verse 19, what is God accomplishing? He is chastening. He's bringing a person back. And then here, verses 29 and 30, the summary of what God does, God is bringing back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. So what is Elihu's heart for Job? What is he desiring to communicate to Job? He is trying to say to Job, Job, God is greater than man because God is a savior. Elihu wants to be a voice proclaiming good news, God will save you. Now, is this a helpful message to Job? Well, we recognize some of what Eliphaz has said has has, has already been, I mean, Elihu has said, Eliphaz has already said some of that, but it is a helpful start because Eliphaz at the very beginning said, maybe God is doing this to work out your good, but he quit saying that. You remember what he and his friends, after Job, Job started to push back against them, they switched and they said, we're pretty sure God is destroying you and condemning you for your sin. 
And they even stopped, they, they, they had a little bit of hope in their messages, but it was mostly, look at how God destroys the wicked. Elihu is doing something, something helpful in that he's restoring to, to the conversation this idea, what if God is doing something good right now? What if God is actually working salvation? I think that's a strength in what Elihu is saying. I think another strength that we can recognize is that Elihu's argument is inductive, not deductive. Inductive, not deductive. What does that mean? Well, a deductive argument will work from premises to conclusion and have a guaranteed conclusion. That's what Job's friends have tried to do. They've tried to work from all people are sinners and suffering is God's punishment for sin. Therefore, Job, because you are suffering, you are in sin and you need to repent. And that's the only way to understand this. Now, that argument hasn't stuck. There are problems with that deductive argument. Elihu has taken another, another direction. An inductive argument, instead of taking the premises and saying we're going to a necessary conclusion, says we're going to take a series of examples and come to a general truth. So we're going to look at how things happen in the world and conclude that there's a general truth that follows. So Elihu is saying, let's look around and see what happens. Sometimes in this world, people sin, and God sends them dreams. And sometimes in this world, people suffer, and God uses that to chasten them for their sin. And sometimes, even God will send an angel and rescue people. But as he adds these up, and, and he's doing this intentionally, verse 29 in, in my translation says, oftentimes, literally he says twice or three times. So he starts counting, God speaks once, twice, and he finishes counting twice, three times. That is, we can keep counting, we can keep adding examples if we want to. In every situation, God works for good. God works for salvation. And that's what he wants Job to conclude, God works for salvation. So those, I think, are some good things about what Elihu is arguing. Now, I think there's, there's a lot of weakness in that Elihu's imagination about what God is doing in Job's life isn't really much different from the friends. So he doesn't really have categories other than, well, sin leads to suffering. He doesn't have certainly what we have in chapter 1, the story that Satan came and approached God and asked for permission to afflict Job, and that that is what led to Job's suffering. He's not imagining that situation. Uh, so if Job were sitting there listening to this, I can imagine Job sitting there feeling very frustrated. I've heard these things before. And yet, perhaps Job also was able to hear this encouragement to think about God as a Savior because Job and his friends have both become stuck on God as a judge. Job and his friends both fixated on that role. The friends, God is a judge who condemns the wicked. Look at the way you're suffering, Job. You're a wicked man being condemned by God and you need to repent and get out of this. Job, switching to the other side, God is a judge, but he's a judge who's messed up. And he's a judge who needs to correct what he's doing. And so Job brings the whole, the whole story of all his righteousness and says to God that God needs to change and vindicate him. And Elihu says, what if that's the wrong category? What if the category we need for thinking about God is not just God as a judge, but God as a savior? What if what we need to focus on is humbling ourselves under God's grace? Not just what do I deserve from God, whether good or bad, depending on Job or his friends, but recognizing we are all sinners, we all deserve punishment, and yet God is gracious <coughs> and gives good gifts and works for the good of his people. And on that, Elihu is right. And Elihu is refreshing the conversation in a good way. And ultimately, this is where Job is going to end up. If you read to the end of the story, you find Job sitting before God, humbling himself and accepting what God has appointed for him. So Elihu is right, but... In some ways, you might say he is more right than he knows. Because he says, God speaks, God has spoken, you just need to listen. There are dreams, there are, there's suffering, there's angels. 
God has an even better gift for Job, doesn't he? God's going to have a personal conversation with Job. Elihu's imagination wasn't big enough for the grace of God and for how God was going to come and reveal himself. God was going to come personally to Job and restore him face to face. Because God is a God who speaks. God is a God who speaks to his people. God is greater than man, including Elihu and his imagination. God has something incredible in store. And that's something as we think about ourselves and what Scripture teaches us that we also need to understand, that we also should be amazed at just how well and clearly and powerfully God speaks to us as a Savior. The book of Hebrews opens with the statement, Long ago, at many times in various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, even more than what Job received, even more than that personal face-to-face conversation, God sent his own son to take on flesh, to dwell among us, to be with us. Again, far beyond what I think Elihu could imagine at the moment. Elihu could say, there could be a mediator, and the mediator could know about a ransom, and somehow things are going to turn out okay. Well, there was a mediator, and there was a ransom. The mediator's job wasn't just to talk about the ransom. He came to be that ransom. He came to give his own life. He suffered even more than Job suffered. He suffered death on the cross, the wrath of God to be the Savior of all who trust in him. So God was doing much more than Elihu imagined, but Elihu was right. God is a Savior. That's what we need to talk about. What did Jesus say when he came in the flesh, to be with us, to speak to us. He said, Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. That's why he was here. Because God is a great God, greater than man. And God seeks out lost sinners to save them from death. This is true no matter what the circumstances. I I read the Beatitudes earlier uh, to help us start thinking about this, that even if we are uh, poor in spirit, mourning, hungering, thirsting, these sorts of things, persecuted, Jesus says, blessed. Jesus says, he is working salvation and good for us. So turning this into an application question, use this to, to consider in your counsel to yourself and others who suffer, do you insist upon hope in God the Savior? In your counsel to yourself and others who suffer, do you insist upon hope in God the Savior? The nature of suffering is that it brings chaos. It brings confusion. Our minds get lost and turned upside down, and that can last for a long time. And maybe, maybe we have some of these other things that Elihu talks about. Maybe you've had some dreams, and you don't know what to do with them. And maybe your conscience is bothered by some of the things that you've thought about. Or, or maybe you have a friend who is, is suffering and feels guilty about that and, and isn't sure why they feel guilty, but they do feel guilty. And, and they're trying to figure out what they're supposed to repent of. And and, and maybe you, you're looking at your own heart and you're saying, I know something's not right here, but, but I don't know what's not right. And I don't know how to move forward. There are lots of hard questions that come in suffering. They take time to work through. We need to wrestle. But we need to have solid ground to stand on as we wrestle, as we go through the pain. And that solid ground that God wants us to know is that his purpose is to save. That the work that he is doing is not ultimately to destroy his people. The final word that he is putting on you if you are his child is not condemnation and destruction, but it is a message of salvation. And that purpose does not change with our pain level. And when you go to the doctor and they say, one through 10, what's your pain level? No matter what you answer, God's purpose for you in Christ is to save you. That is his consistent purpose. That is 
the truth he wants us to hear. That is what Elihu was trying to build, even though he, he needed more categories. That is the truth that Scripture has filled out for us, especially as we see Jesus Christ coming to seek and to save the lost. So when you suffer, when you counsel those who suffer, remember, God is a Savior. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you for this reminder that Elihu brought long ago. He may have made some mistakes, brought the message imperfectly, but yet we thank you for his insistence about your character, that you are a great God because you are a God who saves. Lord, we are often confused as we try to understand how you are saving us, especially when it seems that what you are doing is destroying us instead of saving us. Lord, we pray that you will help us to trust in you. Help us to be steadfast and movable and firm in the faith. Help us to stand on the rock of Jesus Christ, the one who suffered for us. And we pray this in his name. Amen.